You know more about our needs tonight than what we do ourselves. And Lord, tonight you know our weaknesses. And you know our strengths. And God, you know those tonight, Lord, that need divine healing come to their body. And God, I am praying for them. I am. I'm just praying, God, that the Holy Ghost of Heaven will come down and touch these lives. I don't know, to God, the, the answer, except that you are the answer. And Lord, you can heal those that are sick and you can comfort those that need comforting. God, Brother Hartley needs you, God, to touch him. I know, Lord, he's devastated. Lord, he, he's devastated, God, and he needs you, Lord, to touch him. And I just ask you, Lord, to touch God. I do. I, I pray to God for you to touch Cameron and her family. Lord, you see what they're going through, but you're the God that's going to bring them through tonight. And I just ask you, Lord, to meet with us in this service. Touch every heart. Touch the hearts and the lives of the people. God, that need that desperate touch tonight. God, move upon us. Lord, we'll fail not to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name. Yes, sir. I got a quick praise report. Uh, my niece wanted to labor for baby Deuce Turner. Last night, she because they said, the doctor said that they found water on the baby's heart. Well, we prayed and stuck her on the prayer chain. She was delivered last night at 2.50 a.m. Report back this morning was the baby's heart is perfect. Praise God. Give the Lord praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Page six in the hymnal. I want to know more about my Lord.
praise. Hallelujah. 279. Oh, I want to see. As I journey through the land, sing as I go, pointing souls through Calvary to the crimson flow. Many arrows pierce my soul from without the wind, but my Lord leads me on through the mountain's wind. Oh, I want to see Him look upon His face, there to sing forever. Refreshing to me to be able to see you come. 
So I just want to say, God, just reach down and touch you and bless you. We're going to worship God this time through our giving. Unless you're coming to, to uh, lead you in worship and receiving this offering. And I just want you tonight to let the Lord speak to your heart. And you worship God through this giving. I mean, you worship God through this giving. It, that's what it's all about. Let this be an offering unto God. Let this be something that you're going to say, God, this is what I want to give unto you, and I worship you through this offering. Brother Simmons, will you pray for us? Father, Lord God, we love you. We thank you for this day that you've given us to come worship you. I thank you, God, for your love, your mercy, and your grace to each one of us. God bless your people. I pray, God, that you would touch us tonight, touch us through your word, whatever you'd have. God, we give you all the praise and glory. God bless the offering. You just your glory and honor in Jesus' name. We ask. <laughs> bless them. And then on the 31st, can you believe that we're already coming to the end of March? Yeah. Our fifth Sunday, and they're going to be having a fifth Sunday night singing, and after that, the Lighthouse Cafe is going to be uh, serving. Where's she at? You want to tell us about the ladies' conference? Amen. We, we need the Holy Ghost to just shower us, don't we? Pick up the uh, bulletin. See everything on there that is going on and just ask you to be much in prayer for our church. Uh, I had an opportunity to talk with my sister this past Monday and Sister Susan Thomas that is coming here. They just had a women's conference at their church. And she was telling me, she said, John, she said there were people and there were ladies that were from other churches, other denominations. And she said some of them were some Baptist ladies that had come. And she said, we looked up there and said they were laid out on the floor. And said the Holy Ghost was just moving in the place. And one of the ladies that had come, she was sitting by one of the church ladies and started asking, said, do you think all of that is real or could some of that be fake? She says, well, some of it could be fake. She said, is this something like Benny Hinn? Benny Hinn. 
She said, well, it could be something like Benny Hinn. And she said the next thing that she knew, she said the lady had got up and said, I'm going up there. And she went up there, and they got to praying for her, and she became so weak until they had to hold her up. Well, she finally got back to the seat to sit by her friend, and she looked down, and she said, I don't know what that was, but that was so good, I'm thinking about going back up there another time. <laughs> Oh, wouldn't it be awesome if God would just fill the house to where they want to go back and say, Lord, I just want a double dose. Give me a double portion of that. And, and ladies, I want you to be praying because that's what's going to bring the power of God into this women's conference. Amen. I tell you, and that's what we need more than ever before. We need a move of an almighty God. Hallelujah. Sister Reba is coming to St. Force tonight. And let's just worship the Lord with her. God be good to you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. I know I picked the right song because he was just talking about uh, the things God has given us and, and thanking him, thanking the Lord. But this song says so much to thank him for.
you're looking at a person that wasn't always saved. God brought me out of the Moose Lodge of Palmetto years ago. And I thank him each and every day for each and everything he's done for me. He's brought me through my sister and my first husband's death, which was very unexpected. Well, my sister's wasn't, but my first husband's death was very unexpected. And if it hadn't been for the Lord, I don't know where I would be today. So I have a lot to thank God for. Amen. Praise God. I think we all feel that way, don't we? Yes. We've got a lot to be thankful for. So much to praise Him for. God has been so good to us. Praise the Lord. I'm going to ask you tonight to go with me to the book of St. Matthew. That is the first book of the New Testament. But you knew that, right? Praise God. It's page 797 in my Bible on what it is in yours. Thank God for His goodness. I've been coming to you about the parables on Wednesday night. Last Wednesday night, Brother Gavin done a fantastic job in bringing the Word of God. I'm telling you. Amen. He done some great preaching. Just ask you tonight to keep praying for him. He's uh, trying to finish up your MIP and some of the other things he's got on his plate. And just want God to really help him and help Dustin, my son. Both of them are going through it. And uh, there's one of those tests that just don't want to seem to cooperate, but God's going to bring it into alignment. We're just going to ask God to, to touch them. Let me also ask you to continue to pray for Sister Norma. She is uh, yes. she's doing better, but she still needs God to reach down and, yes. and touch her. Yes. So uh, I'm telling you, we have a lot of folks that just need God, don't we? Yes. Yes. Need God to touch them and heal them. I'm going to ask you not to look with me here. Begin with verse 24 of chapter 7 of Matthew. And in my Bible, it is listed as the parable of the two builders. So tonight I want to talk to you about two builders. Two builders. And I really want God to just help us. There are so many things in God's word that it just seems like that God sometimes just opens your eyes, don't he? Mm -hmm. And you get excited all over again. Yeah, so thank you, God, for letting me see that. And I pray that this will be one of those times tonight You'll just get excited about the word of God. And verse 24 said, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Amen. Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand, the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. I want you, first of all, to realize where this parable is written. It is the last part of the Sermon on the Mount. Notice that, because Jesus is saying, this is my conclusion. This is the end of this Sermon on the Mount. And I'm telling you that if you'll hear these sayings of mine and do them, you'll be a wise man. But if you hear these sayings of mine and don't do them, you're going to be a foolish man. And that's how that he is concluding his message. And I want to talk to you tonight about the two different builders that is in this parable. Father, I ask for your anointing tonight. I ask you to God to touch us spiritually, touch us mentally, Touch us physically. God, that this service tonight will be a, a service where that we will grow in you. The presence of God will increase our knowledge, our wisdom. God, give us zeal. My Lord, will you just let the fire of God be kindled afresh and anew in every one of us. Lord, let us be the wise man tonight. Father, not only to hear the word, but to be a doer of that word. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Remember a story I heard several years ago about a man who was a builder. He was a contractor. And his son had started working with him. 
And so his son is there and he tells him, he said, son, he said, I'm going to let you head up this project. We have this house to build and he said, it's, it's on your back. You are totally responsible for this house being built. So the son's eager and he jumps in and he starts building it and his dad would come by and he would talk to him and he would caution him. He said, son, whatever you do, he said, don't cut no corners on this. He said, you know, you, you, you don't want to you don't want to cut corners on it and uh, you want to do the job right. And he would go by and check on it and encourage his son and finally the day comes whenever that both of them are standing back and they're looking at this house that has been built. Both of them are standing there and admiring it. And that contractor who was the dad took the keys and handed it over to his son and said, son, you just built your own house. I was encouraging you not to cut corners. I was encouraging you to do it right. If there's any flaws now, if you cut anywhere, you're the one that's going to have to deal with it. I want you to think about it. Because what we are building is our own house. What we are building, it is our own house. And so when it comes to building this house, you don't want to cut corners. You want to make sure that you're doing the best that you can do. Whenever we, we come to the parable and of the two builders and you begin to realize that Jesus is simply telling us at the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, there's a lot of things that has already been discussed. I mean, a lot of things that the Lord has already told them. And he said, but now I want to see what you're going to do with what you've been taught. There were some of the people who were already trying to get away from the Mosaic law. They thought that it was too stringent. They thought it was too straight. And they thought, maybe I could just run over here to Jesus. After all, it's a mercy and it's a grace message. But whenever Jesus completed the Sermon on the Mount, actually, it was more holy than the Mosaic laws. I mean, Jesus started dealing with the inward man. It wasn't just about the external it wasn't just about the works. He was looking at them and saying, your heart has also got to be right. And so he, he, he looks at all of this and in verse number 24, he said that whosoever will hear these sayings of mine and do them, and do them. As I started reading and studying about this, there were two other Jewish parables that went along with this. They, they're, they're not in the Bible but the Jewish people had these parables. One of them said, The man whose knowledge exceeds his works, to whom is he like? He is like a tree which had many branches and only a few roots. And when the stormy winds came, it plucked up and eradicated. Do you understand what he's saying? He said to that man whose knowledge exceeds his works. What is he saying? The man that knows it but his works does not line up with his knowledge. He said, this man is like a tree that has a lot of branches, but it does not have very many roots. And he said, all it takes is a wind to come along and it's toppled over. But he whose good works are greater than his knowledge to what is he like? He is like a tree which had few branches and many roots so that all the winds of heaven could not move it from its place. So what is this illustration telling us? Without a good root system, it does not matter how pretty the tree is because it doesn't take much to uproot that tree. Amen. And he's saying that you'd be better off to have a good root system that you can endure the winds. Another one says, and this one is coming from Elisha, the son of uh, Abijah, the man who studies much in law and maintains good works is like to a man who built a house laying stones at the foundation and building brick upon them. Notice what he's saying. He's laying stones as a foundation, then he lays his bricks up on them. And he said, though many waters come against it, they cannot move it from its place. 
But the man who studies much in law and does not maintain good words uh, is like to a man who in building his house put brick at the foundation and laid stones upon them so that even gentle waters shall overthrow that house. Once again, the foundation matters. The foundation counts. If you was to look at what the last illustration you would say is one of those upside down houses. It looks like that the floor is on the place where the ceiling should be because the bricks are there and then the foundation is supposed to be laid on top of the bricks. And you're saying how senseless can that be? How senseless it is for a man to hear the word of God, to know the word of God, and yet not do the word of God. How senseless that is. I, and then he went on to talk about that the man who would hear the word and do it, he said, I will liken him unto a wise man. Unto a wise man. What does that mean? He said, I'll liken him to a prudent man, a man of sense and understanding, who foreseeing the evil hideth himself, who proposes to himself the best end, who makes use of the proper means to accomplish it. So what is he saying? He said, this is a wise man that takes everything that he can grasp a hold of and he wants to make it to be the best for the end. Why? Because the wise man understands it's not if a storm is coming, it is when the storm comes. It's not if the winds blow, but when the winds blow. I have to be ready. I have to be strong. True wisdom consists in getting the building of our salvation completed. Now you've gone from bricks and stones to talking about our salvation. Absolutely, because that's what Christ was talking about. He's talking about a man who will hear his words and do them. He said, this is the wise man. He is built upon the rock. And we know that that rock is nothing else but Christ Jesus. Nothing else but Christ. And, and it makes the building firm by keeping close to the maxims of this gospel, having our tempers and lives conform to its word in spirit, and when in order to this we lean on nothing but the grace of Christ, we then build upon a solid rock. I, I, I want you to understand the importance it is of, of knowing that our life is built upon the rock. But what we also use as the material to build that house with counts. But Jesus gave us that material through the Sermon on the Mount. He told us what is expected out of all of us. And I don't have the time to preach the Sermon on the Mount. We might be able to get out of here tomorrow if we could do that. But I, I'm telling you, you need to go back and read chapters 5 and 6 and all of chapter 7. And realize what Christ is trying to say. You would be a wise man to heed to my words. And get really close to the Father. And get your temperament right. Conform to my word. We have too many people today that are trying to build up upon other things besides Christ. And without Christ as your foundation, you're not going to be able to stand. Now, you could be like the upside down house where that you said, I've got all the works in line, but I don't have a foundation. You can have all the works in line, but without a foundation, you're not going to be able to stand. We need a solid foundation. If you remember just a few services back, I preached to you about preparing the soul because that soil is what counts. I, I'm telling you, you can go so Guaranteed seed. Guaranteed it's going to come up. And it will come up. 
But if it is not in the right place, it'll come up and die. It'll come up and wither. It will not be productive. That soil has to be made right. And so it is in building. It has to have a foundation. Amen. Amen. It has to have a foundation. Building our works on Christ as a foundation is sure. But to try to put Christ up and using our works as a foundation is absolutely senseless. We're, we cannot do it our way. We can't. And there's too many people that are still trying to tell God how it should be done. Then Jesus said, there will come times of testing. There will come times of proving if it's been done right. In this world that you and I live in, there's a lot of people that have that the right appearance that everything's all right. But it does not mean everything is all right. And you have to be careful because sometimes the spirit of pride, the spirit of arrogance, it works like termites. It works like ants. It goes in and it just destroys everything internally. Right. And then one day you realize that the ceiling is not where it should be. It's about six inches lower. Why? Because of some of the internal damage that has been done. And so it is whatever that we do without the way that God instructed us to do I was reading today in the book of 1 Chronicles and several times since I've read this it has come back to my mind and I feel like God just brought it back to my mind again. It's a time whenever uh, David has already tried to bring the ark into Jerusalem but he's upset because the old ox shook the cart and uh, a man tries to save it and he's dead. He's dead. And so now there's a few months that's gone by and David said, we're going to do it right this time. And this is what David said. He said, we're going to do it in due process. Go back and study it. He said, we're going to do it in due process. He said, the first time it was not due process. We did not study it. We did not look at it and do it like God said to do it. This time we're going to go back and do it like God said to do it. And he looked at the Levites and said, hey, you're going to sanctify yourself. We're not going to take another chance with this thing. And we're not putting the ark up on no cart. And we're not going to hook nothing to no ox. But according to the ways that God said the ark is to be transported, we're going to put us some poles up right down through the sides of that thing. And so you sanctified men, you're going to put that thing upon your shoulder and we're going to bring it back to Jerusalem just like God said. And whenever they did it by due process, then David was able to dance and to leap and praise God all the way back to Jerusalem and God's blessings was upon Jerusalem. Man, they had a feast, they had a party, there was singing, there was dancing, now, the harps were playing, the trumpets were playing, the cymbals were crashing, now, and everything was going great. You know why? Because they did it God's way. They did it God's way. And there is a due process in the New Testament. We, we cannot alter from it. We cannot. I, I realize that this is not real popular preaching today because uh, an idea of God is anything that you want Him to be. The idea of, of getting to heaven is any way that you want to walk. But no, no, no. You have to go do process of God's Word. That's the only way. He said, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Just because it seems right does not mean it is right. Right? You know, it, it, it used to be that and my wife was just as guilty as I was on this thing. We, we used to love to take a four-wheel drive truck and if it looked like a road, we thought we should be able to go down it. And sometimes we, we come up to places where, I mean, water was all the way across the road. Yeah. It don't matter. We have four-wheel drive. Yeah. You know what I found out? 
Four-wheel drive does not mean it is an amphibious vehicle. Right? And whenever, whenever we started going places that we should not be going, and just because we thought that we could, after all, you know, we had the mud tires, and, and they were bigger tires, and, and four-wheel drive, and we had the power, and we had all of that stuff. But whenever, whenever you got off of that due process, there was no definite way of saying, you're going home by midnight. Some of you act like you've been there. I'm telling you that the word of God said there is a way for us to do it. And we can look and say, but Lord, I have a better way. But God says, no, it's not better. My way is not an alternate. It is the only way. It is the only way. And I, I want you to look at, at this with me because he said there's going to be some trying times. There's going to be some testing times. And, and the Lord went on to say the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house. Well, in, in, in Israel, they really felt like that this was referring back to three different types of, of storms that could come. In Judea, and all the countries in the neighborhood that they considered to be tropics. Uh, they said the rain sometimes would fall in great uh, just torrential rains and it would produce instant rivers and it would sweep away the soil from the rocky hills and the houses which are built of brick only dry in the sun. Uh, uh, then they would just begin to literally wash away. I, I'm talking about the water would dissolve that old clay that they called it brick, but because it had not been prepared right, it would literally just wash the house away. And the floods would occasionally come. These people knew the floods were coming, but they still wanted to take the cheap route. Okay? Now, now follow along with me, because the first of those storms, uh, they said it represents temporal afflictions. Uh, it's coming in the course of a divine providence, and this may be likened to the torrent rains. Uh, and sometimes you don't know why you go through what you go through. That's right. Amen. Sometimes we have temporary afflictions that we're going to be trying. Mm -hmm. And if it's not on the right foundation, and the walls are not made right, you're not going to stand the test. You're going to be swept away in the rain. God, I don't want to be swept away in the rain. And secondly, they said that it referred to the, uh, the trouble or the storms that came from the passions of men, which may be likened to those rivers that are just overflowing where that men's desires get in the way of God's desires. Maybe there are temptations that come and begin to afflict them. And so many times whenever that we're looking at these temptations, we just want to pick up one category or another category. But I, I'm going to tell you what I'm finding. That the category the devil's going to use against you is a category that he knows that you can be tempted in. Okay, You may not be tempted with, with another husband or another wife or, or, or another man or another woman. That may not be your temptation. In fact, I, I heard some people say, Lord, if I ever get rid of this one, I'll never get another one. <laughs> so that, that's, not, that's not a temptation, but the temptation may be drugs. It may be alcohol. All right? It may be stealing your neighbor's belongings. The, the, the devil works in so many. It may be lying. That's right. Oh, not me. There's people that lie whenever the truth would be a fantastic story. That's right. They're going to lie. They are tempted to lie. God help us. God help us. So many times it's the passions of men that begin to burn and they draw away people from God and, and their house is not able to stand. Thirdly, that, that last one that the Lord was talking about where that the winds blew up and, and, and all of these things are coming up against the house saying it could be a temptation from Satan and his angels. 
which is like the whirlwinds that's threatening to carry everything away. I'm going to tell you that's exactly the way the devil gets a lot of people. He gets them caught up in a whirlwind to where they feel like that there is no escape. They cannot get out of it. My mind goes back to several years ago as I was praying with a young man and and and, and his, his plea was if God shows anything to you, if God speaks to you, he said, then, then let me know what God is saying. And I called him back up after praying. I said, I feel like that the Lord has spoke to my heart and said that you're caught up in a whirlwind and you feel like you can't get out of it. He said, you're right. He said, you're absolutely right. He said, I don't see any way out of it. I, I don't see an escape. I, I feel like this is what I'm stuck in now. That's what the devil wants you to do. But I want to tell you, if he had been on the right foundation and it had been built like he should have been built, then the whirlwind would have never been able to pick him up off of that foundation and get him caught up in it. My Lord, help us tonight. Don't you understand that the, the necessity of being anchored to the foundation. You can have the best foundation, but if you're not anchored to the foundation, it does no good. Charlie comes through. You've heard me talk about Charlie. I mean, he was a nightmare. But as we watch our neighbor's house, literally rafters, everything picked up off of those block walls, it tells you it was not fastened right. You have to be attached to the foundation. You've got to be secure to that foundation. Don't let the devil come by and cut the ties. I'm telling you because the whirlwinds of life are going to come our way. They're going to come our way. But if we are tied into the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm telling you that His grace is more than sufficient. And He'll bring you through every storm of life that may come you, your way. You see, Jesus Christ is the rock alone. He's the one that we've got to have everything built upon. I love to sing those songs that talks about the rock of ages, don't you? Because he is the rock of all ages. And Christ is going to stand when nothing else will. I, I was reading something today about John Lennon. How that John Lennon said that that uh, that what was they were more popular than Jesus Christ. And then and then went on to talk away, uh, talk about how that they're going to be longer. But I'm telling you right now, he's gone. Jesus is still around. Amen. 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 He, he wasn't anchored on the right foundation. Right? right? Amen. And I got to read where that uh, Ted Turner, I, I don't even hear too much about him anymore, but where that, you know, he had all of his money and everything, and he come out with this idea, he is rewriting the Ten Commandments. So, so you might remember that. I, I want to tell you, I don't hear nothing about him, but I still hear about Jesus. Right? Listen, we've got to get anchored. We've got to get anchored. It doesn't matter what you think that you've got that is going to cause you to endure the storm. There's nothing going to keep you but the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We have to be anchored in the Lord. I want to be the wise builder. I want to be that prudent man. Amen. I want to be that one that has a sense and an understanding. I can see the evil that's coming upon us and get prepared for it. Be prepared for the storm. Sometimes it pays you to put the shutters down and bolt them. Right? My God help us, Lord. There's so much preaching right here just with the two builders. Now I want you to look with me at the ignore. That's what I call him. This is the man that ignores the instruction. I don't need the instructions. I'm smart enough I can put this thing together. How many men do we have here like that? <laughs> Three hours later, you said, where's those instructions? <laughs> I don't like it when my wife says, why didn't you just use the instructions to begin with? Why don't you just go in the other room until I'm finished? 
you know. Whenever that you start ignoring the instructions. Because Jesus said in verse 26, Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man. Now, I, I want you to understand the first part of that verse. He said that they hear them, but they don't do them. I'm hearing you, but I'm not going to do what you're saying. They are ignoring him. Do you like to be ignored? I don't. If I think one of the grandkids are ignoring me, there's a lot of different ways to get their attention. Right? right. right? Yeah. Mom and Dad had a lot of ways of getting our attention. They did not want to be ignored. When I speak to you, you listen. God is trying to tell us tonight, do not ignore me. What I am trying to tell you is for your own good. You cannot see it right now, but a storm is coming. And if you do it any other way than what I'm telling you to do, you're not going to be able to stand the storm. So do not ignore what I'm trying to tell you. It, this man was considered to be foolish because he simply just ignored it. He ignored it. I, I want to read this to you. One of the commentators said, was there ever a stricter system of morality delivered by God to man than in this sermon? Please go back and read the Sermon on the Mount again. Go back and take a look at it. I, I'm telling you, you'll, you'll find it where that he said, you're going to have to love everybody. You find it where he said, if you don't forgive, your father's not going to forgive you. you you'll, you'll find it here to where that he says, don't judge. I'm the judge. You'll find it here where he's talking about prayer. He talks about giving. He talks about fasting. He talks about loving your neighbor as yourself. He talks about blessing those that curse you. Talks about doing good to those that do you wrong. He, he, he talks about whenever people are seeking out vengeance for their own self, how that it's wrong. He talks about divorce. He talks about murder. He talks about adultery. He talks about fulfilling the laws of all of this stuff is right here in the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, the Lord has laid it out there. But yet, whenever that you start looking at this, he said, he who reads or hears it and does not look to God to conform his soul and life to it. I think that's putting it in simple terms. You, you have to pray and ask God to help you to conform your life your soul to his word. Right? I'm not just going to be anchored on that rock, but I shall build with the word that he has put all around me. Notwithstanding his hoping to enter into the kingdom of God, he said, this man is a fool who built his house upon the sand. So what is he saying? If you're not going to allow the spirit of God to conform you to the word of God, then you're like the foolish man that's building on the sand. That's right. Yep. We, 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 we cannot just say, I know the word. We must pray for God to conform us to the word. Because whenever the rains and the rivers and the winds come, uh, his building is going to fall. Uh, it's going to crush. It's going to come to ruins. Uh, why? Because all that he did was talk about Christ, talk about his righteousness of uh, he talked about the merits. He talked about the atonement. Uh, while the person is yet not conformed to his word and in his spirit, uh, he is doing nothing but deceiving himself. We can talk about it all day long, but if we don't conform to it, we can talk about righteousness. We can talk about purity. We can talk about how, how that uh, all of the blood bought atonement and all of these things, but unless it's applied, we are deceiving ourselves to think all I can do is talk about it. But I do not have to activate it in my life. He went on to say, let it be observed that it is not the man who hears or believes these sayings of Christ. Notice what he said, it's not the man that hears and believes. Because we have a lot of people today 
I, I'm going to tell you sometimes I get upset with people. Because it, I believe it. I believe there's a hell. I believe Jesus is coming. I believe there's a great tribulation sitting on the right. Then why aren't you in the right? You know, it, it's mind-boggling. Then why aren't you doing what you know? Because these people that hear and they say that they believe and they're thinking now, my, my building is going to stand, but it's not. Whenever the earth and all this works are burn up and consumed, their building is also going to be consumed. It's not going to stand the test. Many suppose that the law of Moses came along to abolish. No, no, no. Merely because it is too strict, they said, let's do away with it. They said, there's too many things in there to observe. Let's do away with it. And so now, even the world that you and I live in, they feel like that the gospel has brought such a liberation from all of its obligations. The gospel did not do away with the obligations. The gospel did not do away with the obligations of serving God, living right, and having a righteous way to live. It did not do it. Yes, I know the gospel is full of grace, is full of mercy, but it does not take away the obligation that we have to live according to the word of God. Amen. We have to live it. In the, in the whole of the old covenant, nothing can be found so exceedingly strict as this sermon. And I know I've said that, and I'll probably say it again. I feel like this is a point I need to drive home. I, I can read the Old Testament and honestly, I start looking at all those sacrifices and I start reading about this and I, I'm thinking, Lord, how in the world did Aaron ever memorize all of that? Right? How did Phineas, how did Eleazar, how did all these other priests come along and memorize all these? Lord, they, they had to study all the time. Or maybe somebody comes and says, well, I, got a, I, I have a wave offering. Let me open up the book to wave offering. You know, a praise offering. Let me see what it says about a praise. No, these guys had it memorized. I mean, it was in there. And some people say, oh, it's just too much in there. Nowadays, we can just go back to grace and mercy. And all of that grace and mercy does not cause us to walk away from whenever a man is born again. That old man must die to his carnal ways and we become a new creature in Christ Jesus. We no longer live according to the sinful man, to the sinful nature. We now live according to the righteous man through Christ Jesus. Preacher, it's hard. Not when the old man dies and we become that new man. The new man starts living. Many people wanted to get away from the Moses and his laws and the covenant. And they said, well, it's just too hard. I'm telling you today that there is nothing, nothing that can ever take the place of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's that blood that washes away our sins. But if you think that just because the blood has been applied to your life, that now I can go back out here and sin, you go think again. You need to go back and study the word. The blood does not give you the right to sin. It does not give you the law to sin. It washes away your sin. And it causes you to become a new creature in Christ Jesus but yet God's still given unto you that human right that you can choose uh, to walk away. And I know so many people are saying, yeah, but those that are in Christ that no man can pluck them out of his hand. Friend, you can take yourself out of the hand of God. I can't make you sin, but you can choose to sin. Right? I get tired of people talking about the devil made me do it. Sometimes I don't think the devil had nothing at all to do with it. I think it was just a carnal man. Oh, that's another message for another time, isn't it? And then look, the same thing that happened to the wise man happened to the foolish man. The rains did come. The rivers did flow. And the winds did blow. But the thing is, with the wise man, he had a foundation, built his house according to the word and the ways of God, and he was able to withstand the whirlwind. 
to foolish men, it does not even take a whirlwind. Hear me. He does not have a solid foundation. Have you ever heard the word erosion? Not too long ago, I went back down Peace River. Whenever that we were in Nocatee, I'd go down that river. I could just about tell you where every sandbar was. I could tell you where the stumps were in the river. I knew what side of the river I needed to be on. I knew whenever I needed to be in the middle of the river. I knew all of that. But in the years that we lived at Nocatee, the thing I observed about Peace River was every time that the waters did come up, things changed in the river. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Things changed in that river. That river does not have a foundation of rock. The last time I went down it, I started looking for trees that I used to fish under, and I found them laying in the river. Why? Why? The rains did come and the river did flow and it washed the foundation out from underneath those mighty oaks and the mighty oak did tumble. So it is with you and I. You may think I'll never fall but if you're not anchored into that foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ the winds and the rains are going to come. They're going to blow and it's going to rain. The waters are going to rise and the river's going to flow and it's going to wash the foundation out from underneath of us. I told my wife, I said, the river's changed. The river's changed. Why? Because of the rains. And I want to tell you, as a child of God, you're going to face the storms. And you're going to have to be anchored. You're going to have to be anchored. Or else the foundation will be washed out from underneath of you. Hear what I'm trying to tell you. Hear me tonight. It's coming. First Corinthians, the third chapter, verses 13 and 14. He said, every man's work shall be made manifest. It's going to be tried. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. What is he trying to tell us? He said, I'm telling you, it's going to be tried. The devil is not just going to let you walk into heaven. Okay? And not only that, the bride of Christ is going to be a tried bride. And then in 1 Peter 1 and 7, he said that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than a gold that perished, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And then I read word that he said that when he does come back, shall he find any faith? Why? Because there are some people that heard the word, believed the word, but never built according to the word. And so their faith is also blown away. You come to the piano for me. I I want you to listen to this this story that about the fishermen in Bengal. They say that in the dry season, they go out to where the bed to where that the beds of sand are. And they build their houses up on those sand beds. They know, they know it happens that whenever the rains start coming and the mountains are filled with that rain that the waters are going to start flowing And they know that river is going to swell. They knew that where they built their house was once covered in water. But they built there anyhow. And they said at times all it takes is one night. You could go to bed and your house is on a sand bed. And you can wake up in the morning. If you wake up and your house is not only gold. Nobody can even see the place on the ground where you ever build it because all of that is covered with the water. You say, Brother Spallin, it sounds like those people are foolish. Call it what you might. But I'm telling you that we've got a lot of people 
and do the very same thing when it comes to serving God. Let's don't be foolish. Let's be a wise builder. Let's build upon the foundation of God. Tonight, I'm going to ask you to come and pray with me. I want you to ask God, God, help me to build right. Will you please help me? Help me to build according to the Word. And God, if I've started to deviate, if I've started coming up with short shortcuts, please help me, God. Because I know that, Lord, that shortcut is going to cost me. It's going to cost me. Will you just come find your place to pray this afternoon? Let's just ask God to help us. You might have said, Preacher, I, I started building right a long time ago, but how are you building right now? How, what kind of a maintenance are you doing upon your spiritual house? What kind of a maintenance are you doing on a spiritual house? Oh, God, help me. I want to build right. I want to build it right, Lord.
get into the presence of God, anything can happen. But whatever does happen will glorify the Father and bring glory to Him. And that's what I want. I ask you to be much of prayer for our service this Sunday and all the activities that's going on in between now and Sunday. We just pray that God will just have more give direction and guidance. Families that need comforting. I tell you, there's just so much today that people are hurting. I know that it goes on all the time, but whenever it's people that you know, then it's, it's like it just affects you more. But God knows the need, don't He? He knows the need. I appreciate you so much for being with us tonight. And I really do appreciate Brother Logan. He does a fantastic job back there. He's been much too powerful. Yeah. He deserves that. He deserves a pay raise. <laughs> Will you stand with us? Pastor. Yes, sir. Uh, I got a text from Chris. He said that uh, mom needs another prayer cloth. Pray for her. Somehow I got away from her in the hospital, so. I had an opportunity to visit with Sister Cashmore yesterday. And I will tell you, I felt God in that hospital room. She needs, she needs God to really touch her. She told me yesterday, she said that if you was to ask her what the pain level was from 1 to 10, she said at times I tell you it's a 15. She said it's that bad. Sometimes she just lays her and cries. And I know there's a God in heaven. How many of you know there's a God in heaven that's able to heal this body? Hallelujah. We always have time to pray. I need some of you that's going to believe God with me. Come on.
sing this song like you believe it tonight. Like I can do. power that is healing the people right now. Even as, even as the prayers were going up, healing was coming down in the name of Jesus. We give you praise and honor and glory for testimonies, powerful testimonies that are about to come from all the healing in the camp. In the name of Jesus.